Hello everybody and welcome to episode 111 of the Dry Dock. Today's questions are taken from the Guide 177, that is the Kaiser class battleships of Imperial Germany, as well as the first part of the video series on Admiral Nelson. So let us begin. Imigdio's back, I think, asks, will you consider in future remaking videos of ships that become museum ships with video footage of you visiting them? Indeed, but if I'm going to go to the time and expense of visiting a museum ship and spending half a day to a day there taking a load of film footage, then I'm not going to redo a five minute guide. I would probably turn that into a general Wednesday special video detailing the history of that ship. So, for example, I know I've done, I think I've done HMS Warrior at some point, but I would do a full Wednesday special on HMS Warrior, and there are a fair number of different ships out there, as well as the locations actually, which I've been planning to do either a video about or a video that strongly involves them, which I have then subsequently not done because obviously with the current situation I haven't been able to actually visit them. Uh, so, for example, the video that uh, the five minute guide I did on Midway, USS Midway, um, originally that was going to be a full on hour long Wednesday special about the Midway class carriers, because let's face it, as I pretty much found out trying to fit it into five minutes, you can't fit the story of the Midway class into five minutes. So it was going to be part of the America tour, it was going to be hour long detailing the full history of the Midway class, but I haven't been able to do it. So. Um, I've had to do the basically the design history up to commissioning of the Midway class and then it's just a question of if I can make it to the States in Easter 2021 then what will follow will be an extended look from Midway herself on the history of the ship and her class and if not I guess I'll have to just do a couple of five minute guides about Midway and Coral Sea etc. Joel Kunkel, I think, asks, what's the difference between good coal and bad coal? So coal comes in a number of different forms, but broadly speaking, as far as warships are concerned, you're generally looking at three types of coal. At the absolute top end, you have anthracite coal. And anthracite coal is very hard, um, very, very high carbon content. It's effectively near as much as it makes no difference pure coal. Um, you're talking about carbon content, something in the mid-90 percentile range. The only purer form of coal is technically graphite, but yeah, good luck setting fire to graphite. Um, now, it has the highest energy density of any coal that's commonly used in fuel furnaces, and that's basically how much energy in megajoules do you get out of something per kilo when you burn it. So anthracite coal is definitely what you want to have. It, let's say it's got, it'll release the most energy per kilo, so for a given cargo hull, let's say you're carrying a thousand tons of coal, more energy either means more power, thus you go faster, or it means you need to use less coal to get the same energy, which means you can go further for the similar speed. It also means your engines are going to have a relatively easy time of it, because without it containing too many impurities, it's mostly going to just burn. So you won't get ash deposits and all other kinds of fun deposits gunking up your boiler tubes, which is a significant advantage. So once you're outside of anthracite, you descend through the bitumous coals and you end up at the lowest end, at least as far as uh, fuel goes, with lignite. Now, whereas, as I said, anthracite is a fairly hard, shiny black substance, um, lignite is much softer, much more easy to break, and it also tends to be a dark brown colour. Or to put it another way, if you had a fist-sized lump of anthracite and you lobbed it at somebody's head, uh, you're probably going to go to prison because that's going to hurt quite badly. Whereas some of the really poor quality lignite stuff, you're probably just going to break it across their forehead. I mean, yeah, it'll hurt a little bit, but they're more likely to be annoyed about the fact that you threw something at them in, in principle than any particular injury. Um, some of the, well, you say slightly better quality lignites, that's like saying the slightly better quality limb loss, um, but some of the slightly better quality lignites are a little bit more solid than that. Now, lignite has low 20-ish uh, percent carbon content um, at the absolute minimum, it gets up to maybe 
just over half, but it has loads of impurities, and those can be impurities from completely inert uh, things all the way through to relatively volatile elements, which make it somewhat unpredictable, although somewhat easier to set fire to in the first place as compared to something like anthracite. Um, and the other problem is it also has a lot of moisture content normally. Now, putting in high moisture lignite, basically it's almost not worth doing, um, because of the low carbon content, it's got fairly low uh, energy capacity anyway, so you're going to end up having to burn a lot more of it to get some level of heat out of it. But if you put in high moisture content stuff, then a lot of the energy that you generate by burning it is just going to go into vaporizing the water that's inside it, so the overall out energy output is incredibly low. It will also generate massive amounts of soot ash and other byproducts as well as obviously therefore going into lots of smoke um, and hilariously enough all those trace volatiles that they might have in it will also tend to cause very very localized hot burning so even though its overall energy output is lower lignite will tend to actually do more damage to things like gr fire grates and other support structures so if you try and fuel a warship using a mixture of lignite and bitumous coal, you're going to end up see, being seen by everyone for miles around because you're going to be moving under a giant black pool of smoke. You're not going to go anywhere near as far or as fast because the amount of coal that you can shovel into a given space with, say, a boiler is limited and that coal isn't going to be putting out as much energy. Um, so you're either going to have to burn it up really, really fast to and just shovel through loads of coal which is obviously uh, going to deplete your stocks fairly quickly or you're just going to have to accept a lower power output and of course all those byproducts are going to clog up your grates your flues your boiler tubes etc etc which means that sooner rather than later you're going to have to slow down and clear everything out because with it all gunked up airflow and heat transfer is going to drop through the floor and this was actually one of the major issues in World War One because the Royal Navy had access to one of the world's rarer types of coal, good quality anthracite coal, in relatively large amounts, whereas Germany has huge quantities of lignite um, and uh, a little bit of bitumous coal, but basically no anthracite. So once they were cut off from the international trade uh, network which allowed them to import high quality anthracite coal the high seas fleet did have a significant problem because they had to run on this lower quality coal and that meant that uh, you could have things such as some of the german battle cruisers on their trials um, with all the other things going in their favor but also having anth anthracite coal on board that been bought in could yeah quite easily hit 26 27 knots maybe more once they were out in service during the war and they were mostly using a mixture of bitumous and lignite coal that you could drop through four or five knots from that speed um, quite comfortably um, if things got really bad and as was mentioned in the Battle of Jutland video after less than a day of full speed operations a number of German torpedo boats were unable to execute Scheer's orders to attack the Grand Fleet because the horrific quality coal that they'd been burning had clogged their boilers to an extent that they couldn't even catch a pre-dreadnought, let alone make a fast attack on the Grand Fleet. Mate Havelik asks, how exactly do you scuttle a ship when there are no friendly forces to torpedo it? It depends on the era. I mean, the use of torpedoes suggests we're in the modern era, but in the old days you could scuttled something like a wooden ship just by setting fire to it because once a wooden ship gets properly alight there's precious little you can do to stop it burning out um, now in the more modern era when ships well they can still be set on fire but it's a lot harder the easiest way to do it is with explosives now some ships might come with scuttling charges already in place um, or stored somewhere in the ship and what these basically just blow holes in the hull to let lots of water in and down the ship goes. Alternatively, if you need a quick scuttling and you don't have uh, any torpedoes uh, or any scuttling charges on board, you can use things like torpedoes that you might have on board. Um, 
or if you're really, really desperate, your magazines, and set up some kind of jury-rigged explosive, whether that be on a timer, whether you just set fire to stuff nearby and calculate roughly how long it's going to take those flames to spread, or if you're somewhat less suicidal, um, implement some kind of basic timing device on something like a torpedo warhead. And that will kind of be a jury-rigged scuttling charge. The other way to do it, which is somewhat slower and somewhat easier to reverse, but can ultimately still be obviously just as effective, is to simply open valves and uh, doors and hatches and things like this. Now, often this is done in conjunction with explosive charges in order to speed up the rate of flooding, but you've got to remember there are actually multiple ways for water to enter a ship by design. Well, not deliberately by design, but there are holes in the hull basically so you can have the seacocks um, which will normally admit large amounts of water for things like firefighting you've obviously got valves which will allow you to do things like flood the magazines you've got potentially intake valves to bring in seawater for things like the boilers if you absolutely have to resort to that obviously if your ship has submerged torpedo tubes then uh, those are an option as well and so by either breaking in incoming pipes or just opening the things up and not having the bulkheads that would confine the flooding to a certain area of the ship closed, um, then you basically can just let quite a lot of water in very quickly. And again, just have to hope that whoever's doing this has a clear and quick way out. And all of these are ways of scuttling a ship without having to have someone nearby to blow holes in it from the outside. Holden Rogers asks, were any warships used for non-military uses after ships were sold off at the end of both world wars? Yes, well, I mean, obviously there's the slightly cheaty way of saying museum ships, but outside of that, there were quite a number of warships that were sold off and then converted to civilian use, but they tend to be almost exclusively the smaller ones. The reason there's a flower class corvette on screen is because a number of those were turned into civilian use. So yeah, corvettes, sloops, um, that that kind of size of vessel are the most common because really when you're looking at the larger warships, destroyers are designed to go really fast and very, very few civilian uses have, require ships to go that quickly. And obviously there's issues there with fuel economy and maintenance of high pressure machinery, which if you don't need the speed is completely unnecessary as an expense. Plus, when you're looking at a lot of things like crew, uh, destroyers and cruisers and battleships, not only is there the expense of running and maintaining them, but there's also the fact that, again, cruisers especially, designed for speed, battleships designed for protection, there's an awful lot of dead weight on them when it comes to trying to employ them for civilian use, and the military's not really going to let you keep the guns and armour, um, let's say, unless it's going to be a museum ship. So if you remove the say, the armour and turrets from a battleship, so it's now got no protection and no weaponry, it's going to sit so high in the water that its stability is going to be significantly compromised, and pretty much the same thing for a cruiser. Uh, the cruiser has that added problem, again, of being designed for high speed, um, but even a relatively slow-speed battleship, what are you going to use it for? Um, it's definitely not a luxury liner and you're not going to convert it into one for anything like an economical cost. You might as well just build a new one. Um, and yeah, just converting it into a cargo ship would be even sillier. Um, there are obviously fleet auxiliaries and stuff that are quite large, which have been converted to civilian use when they've been sold off. But that's mainly because they were effectively militarized cargo vessels in the first place. Whereas when you talk about something like a sloop or a corvette, they're small. Um, so they're much easier to run with a small crew. They're not particularly quick, which means the maintenance requirements on their power plants are usually nowhere near as strenuous and therefore much more easily done within the civilian realm. And also, when you're talking about the smaller vessels, quite a lot of them were based on pre-existing civilian designs like whalers, fishing ships, and that kind of thing. And so they can quite often be turned back to those kind of uses. Um, some sort of service as tugs, and there's also the fact that, to be perfectly honest, a small ship is going to have a much shallower draft, and let's face it, the vast majority of the world's shipping by numbers, if not by tonnage, 
is coastal, so there's a much higher chance of someone finding a use for an X warship with if its relatively minor armament removed, if it's something along this kind of size line, uh, in a coastal environment than it is someone somehow having some use for a deep water disarmed cruiser or something like that. So yeah, quite quite a few different non-military uses, but mostly at the smaller end of things, unless you're talking about museum ships. Eblingus asks, why did they put single tube fixed torpedo launchers in battleships? So the answer is twofold. One is that they didn't just install single submerged torpedo launchers. Um, there were a number of ships that carried more than that, but they were relatively few and far between, to be fair, and that did go down as time went on. Now, as I've discussed in previous videos, there was the option to use the onboard gyro compass on the torpedo to set it running in a slightly different direction to its initial launch direction, so the fixed part wasn't too much of an issue. The main reason why they very rapidly went down to single torpedo launchers was because, well, after an initial flurry of interest, it became very rapidly apparent that torpedo launchers on a battleship would be very much a secondary or even possibly a tertiary weapon, uh, basically used to finish off opponents, take lucky chance shots, um, or as a very, very last ditch extra deterrent of defense. So they weren't going to be the primary weapon. The The whole policy had come in at a time when torpedoes actually matched or even in some cases outranged the main guns, but this wasn't really an issue of the gun's range being particularly short. It was the accuracy of actually shooting them in the first place, the fire control systems. Once those fire control systems had gone into place, the idea of torpedoes as a primary armament of a battleship very rapidly dwindled. And people began to realise that, well, as you can see here from uh, HMS Nelson's torpedo room, torpedoes take up a lot of space. If you're going to have several torpedoes per torpedo launcher, which you probably would need if you're ever going to practically use them, that means an awful lot of space. And on top of that, you've got to have the maintenance space, you've got to have uh, machinery to move the torpedoes, because they're far too heavy to move manually. You've got to have the actual launcher itself... And you've got to have space for everyone to move around to carry out all these tasks in. That actually adds up to quite a large internal volume space that you can't subdivide with bulkheads. And if there's one thing that naval designers really, really hate, it's large internal void spaces below the waterline of a ship. I mean, persuading a naval architect to give the engineering department enough space for their machinery is difficult enough, and that's the stuff that's needed to make the ship go. Uh, whilst what was very called a torpedo room or a torpedo flat. That was something that, well, it contains explosives anyway, both in terms of the torpedo's warhead and in terms quite often of the fuel and the compressed air. And it's a huge flooding risk. Now, this could work in both good and bad ways. For example, with yeah, actually in the same battle, um, Chutland, Lutzow was pretty much almost certainly doomed from the minute that Invincible put a couple of shells through its torpedo flat because the the space was so big and uh, had so much volume that once that started flooding the writing was on the wall for Lutzow it was going to go down at some point sooner or later as that flooding spread because of the sheer weight of water caused by flooding that single space whereas almost the complete opposite which was Sadlitz where pretty much everything in the bow flooded except the torpedo flat and because it managed to maintain its watertight integrity it acted as effectively a giant air sort of life preserver big air pocket that kept the ship marginally afloat just long enough to make it home and this kind of hazard especially in the Lutzow's case obviously was known and appreciated as a trade-off for having the potential extra sting of torpedo launchers and so one of the ways to minimise this when it became obvious that the torpedoes weren't going to be the primary weapon was to just have a single launcher, which obviously requires a lot less space than the machinery launchers, plural, and multiple torpedoes you'd have to carry if you were going to have a twin launcher or something like that below the waterline. Thomas Zinzer asks, Given the Royal Navy's habit of naming some ships after admirals, do you think it's likely that any ships will be named after World War I or World War II admirals anytime soon? And if so, would it be fitting for Jackie Fisher to have a ship named after him? 
so traditionally, the Royal Navy has a fairly eclectic way of naming capital ships. They either name them after qualities, like illustrious, invincible, uh, or concepts like victory, or they name them after old Royal Navy warships of some note, which leads to all sorts of weird and wonderful naming descriptions. So you've got War Spite, which is a conjunction, as I've said in another video, of a much older term of War's Spite. You've got Arc Royal, um, which by modern English grammar is entirely the wrong way around, but made sense back then. Um, you've uh, got obviously uh, things like Dreadnought, which is a very old name, again, it, which is a compaction of an older older term that was actually in two words um and of course you have naming ships for admirals so this is where you get anson howe rodney nelson and so on and so forth now there is a little bit of cross-pollination there so for example although mary rose was a tudor capital ship the modern day hms mary rose uh, back in World War One, was a destroyer, um, and I must admit, actually, one of the things that slightly irritates and confuses me about the modern Royal Navy is that the naming schemes are sometimes consistent and sometimes wholly inconsistent. So if you look at the latest, say, two major ship classes going back a couple of generations, you've got the Type 42 Destroyer, but when you look at the names, Sheffield, Birmingham, Newcastle, Coventry, uh, Glasgow, Cardiff, etc., these are all names of town-class cruisers from World War II. So, I mean, I mean, it just makes a certain amount of sense. They are, a, I mean, they're a bit smaller than the actual town class from World War II, but they're about the same displacement as the town class from World War One. But at the same time. You look at the Type 23 frigates, and that's all over the shop. You've got Norfolk, which was previously a county-class heavy cruiser. You've got Marlborough, which used to be a battleship. Um, you've got Iron Duke, again, another battleship. Um, then you've got things like Montrose, Westminster. So you've got a mixture of county-class heavy cruiser names, town-class light cruiser names, and capital ship names on what's ostensibly a frigate class. And then with the Type 45s, they are all got names beginning with D, so they're all named after D-class or Daring-class destroyers. So you've gone with your largest ships now carrying a destroyer set of names instead of a light cruiser set of names. But the Type 26s are using town-class cruiser names, even though they are smaller than the Type 45, so that's all a bit upended. About the only consistency appears to be these days in Royal Navy submarine and cap and full-on capital ship names, as attack submarines are still going by the flotilla sort of letter designation. So the astute class are all using uh, le uh, names beginning with A. Although even there they are bringing in uh, capital ship names like Audacious. The um, big submarines, the uh, nuclear missile subs. Again, they're using, in this at the moment, V-class designations, but, again, bringing in things like Vanguard and Vengeance, those are definitely capital ship names, and the new Dreadnought type are, as the name suggests, using capital ship names as well, so Dreadnought, Valiant, War Spite, and King George VI, which we are now due for, and, of course, the carriers are using... Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, which are both battleship names, i.e. capital ship names. So... We don't currently have any Admiral-named capital units in the Royal Navy at the moment. And this leaves the Royal Navy, I think, in a bit of a quandary, because they're not planning on buying any new carriers anytime soon, and they're not planning on building any more Dreadnought class than have already had their names spoken for. So, in theory, we're not likely to get any ships named after admirals anytime soon but then on the other hand as the destroyers and frigates showed uh, that doesn't necessarily have to hold true so in theory i guess you could say that maybe the type 31s might be named for admirals now if they were personally i think there are a number of world war one and world war two admirals who would be deserving of having a ship named after them um, whether or not the Royal Navy would 
go as far as saying we're going to name the Type 31i the smallest major surface combatant in the fleet after an Admiral? I don't know, but let's say if they were going to build a class of five, then yeah, I would I would support the idea of using World War One and World War Two Admiral names. I'd probably go with say uh, Jellico, Fisher, Cunningham, Somerville, and Vian. That would make a really good World War One World War Two selection. However, if they were going to do that, I rather suspect that the Royal Navy will probably reach into its big book of older names, which have the added advantage of being names that have been used on Royal Navy ships before, so they have the history to them as well. And maybe they'll slip a World War One or maybe a World War Two Admiral in there as well, on top of that. Soap Jason. Well, well that's got an exclamation mark after the soap part, but I'm not going to shout it. Uh, asks, he, what he says is a semi-simple question, what's the hardest part about running a channel like this? What's the hardest can vary from day to day and week to week, to be perfectly honest. Um, sometimes, unfortunately not very often, but sometimes, and I suppose you probably hear this from a lot of YouTubers, and to be honest, I honestly thought I wouldn't suffer from this too much, but occasionally I do. Sometimes negative comments can really sort of leave you sitting there going, what's the point? Um, f luckily for me, I tend to be able to get over those in like a day or so, if it, even if it's been really nasty. Um, it, it kind of helps that, to be honest, some of the nastiest comments that have been left, the most negative, tend to be A, couched in um, very offensive speech anyway which immediately puts my hackles and defenses up um, but to also often actually betrays the fact that either they haven't listened to anything i've said or they haven't watched much if any content um so that that does bring me kind of a little bit of comfort and to be perfectly honest i mean there are things where the channel can be improved there are there is legitimate criticism that can be leveled um but I'm actually, I think, very lucky in that the majority of that kind of comment t tends to be very well articulated and usually actually has some relatively helpful feedback in there as well. So one of the things that's cropped up in the past few months has been issues around audio level and actually a number of them have said well actually i think your audio is too quiet but have you thought about doing this this and this which is actually that that's the kind of criticism that's quite useful because it's not only this is a problem um but they're also offering suggestions on how to fix it because this is the thing it's like i'm not deliberately out going out there to cause problems uh, with the channel so i think i'm doing what passes for a reasonable job um <laughs> And so if I am doing something wrong, just saying this is wrong, I'm going to go, well, how how is that wrong? I don't understand. Um, but if someone says, well, I think this is wrong and this is why, it's like, oh, okay, I can investigate this. And hopefully the audio issues have been somewhat more resolved. Um, a couple of subscribers did actually get in contact and offered their own expertise, which helped quite considerably. Um, so hopefully that's been somewhat addressed. Um, if some of you are still having audio issues, then I can only apologise, but it's a learning process trying to obviously learn the history, articulate the history, and also sort of be a audio-visual video editor and audio editor at the same time. Um, there is only one of me, at least until they invent cloning, and if they do, I think cloning myself is probably against the Geneva Convention somewhere in down there, so... Unfortunately, clone drag assistants are probably not in the near future. But outside of that, um, the two other hardest things about running the channel are actually, well, one is actually in some way, in a lot of ways actually a positive, which is that um, quite a number of people who are experts in their field have come forward and offered to help with content, up to and including um, appearing in audio form in, on the channel, obviously, uh, recently, we've had a second appearance by Justin with a follow-up to the A6M0 video. And I've actually got a bank of about half a dozen um, interview-style videos like that. Actually, slightly more than that now, which I am trying to get 
processed and onto the channel, but it's it's almost like a surfeit of riches in that manner. It's like people want to give me content so much I've got content backed up, which in a way is good, but in a way I do kind of feel bad for the people who maybe I've spoken to two or three months ago and I've still not managed to get around to putting that bit up on the channel because of the backlog. And the other hardest part, to be perfectly honest, is keeping up because... If there's one thing that this channel has helped me to do, it's to expand my own knowledge. Because, well, with the re the revenue that comes in from the channel, I try and reinvest as much of that as possible into the channel by um, getting archive materials like photos that I can scan and digitize, as I've mentioned before, for everyone to use. Um, but also uh, books and resources to help my own knowledge to go into some of the more niche topics and uh, niche ships that perhaps I had a, a relative degree of knowledge of. Maybe it might have been surface level, it might have been deeper, but going into expanding that knowledge to a level that I can then articulate it to you as the listeners, that's probably actually the hardest and in some ways the most fun challenge. So for example, um, with things like Cracking of Enigma and... Bletchley Park and stuff like that somewhat unsurprisingly given how much of a big deal at least it gets made of these days um, I'm actually old enough to remember a point when virtually no one knew about it only just um, but there you go I can and have probably for a long time have been able to give people a fairly decent rundown of what happened at Bletchley Park but when it comes to things like uh, the Japanese reading some American and British codes or the Americans reading Japanese codes. I knew that this had happened and with the Americans reading the Japanese codes I could actually give probably a good five ten minute rundown of what happened but I wouldn't be able to go into much more depth than that without doing further research but these are now the kinds of topics people ask about. So for example in the video on Enigma people have asked well um, what what about the Japanese reading uh, Allied codes, what about the Italians reading Allied codes, what about the Germans reading Allied codes, what about the Americans reading Japanese codes, and things like this. So those are good and worthy questions, but to give everyone a fair shake at the stick, that means I've got to be able to produce a similar level of content as what I did for Enigma, so that means sort of half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour's worth of content, and so that means getting two or three books on the subject, reading those, checking their sources, going back and having a look at papers and where possible um, primary source material if it's reasonably accessible and building up my own level of knowledge so that I can then add that to a long list of videos to produce for Wednesday specials. So, yeah, um, exercising brain. It, it can be hard, but it is rewarding and hopefully generates plenty of uh, content for people to listen to as well. Shadow asks, what was the genuine strength of the Royal Navy in World War II? I'm sure it's TV hyperbole, but sometimes the Royal Navy is portrayed as near godlike, a globally dominating force, that it would be suicidal for the Shan Horse, the Italian-Italian Navy Operation Sea Lion to challenge, and other times they're on a near knife edge needing to beg for ancient four-stack US destroyers to stave off the wolf packs and one turpits away from ceasing to exist. Is the truth somewhere in between? Yeah, pretty much. And to be honest, the true strength of the Royal Navy in World War II varied across the duration of World War II. Um, you see, the Royal Navy went into World War II as the joint largest navy on the planet, and it had its own ideas about how to fight wars, it had its own ideas about who it was likely to engage, and it was also in the middle of a desperate rearmament that was mostly focused on a war breaking out in the early 1940s and was forced to fight a lot sooner than it had actually wanted to. And naturally, over the course of the first third of the war, it went from having its full strength and a fairly powerful ally against a single enemy, that being the Kriegsmarine, which was probably the smallest and least of the concerns that the Royal Navy had on its enemy list, to fighting... The Kriegsmarine, the Regia Marina, and the Imperial Japanese Navy, all at the same time, whilst the ally that it had been counting on, the Marine Nationale, mostly bowed out of the equation. I mean, I, on the other hand, they did get a, a fair collection of Norwegians, uh, Danes, Poles, uh, Dutchmen, and the occasional Free Frenchmen, who were all very happy to join in, and obviously later on the Americans also joined. Um, 
But yes, compared to what they thought they were going to have to fight, the, the actual situation was entirely different. I mean, on screen at the moment probably doesn't quite portray the exact state of the Admiralty Office by early 1942, but it's probably not a tremendous distance off of reality, to be perfectly honest. And I think this is where a lot of these sort of very wildly swinging views come from, because it's more about what force the Royal Navy could exert in the theatre in question at the time. Um, so, for example, when the Germans were sending out, say, say the so-called pocket battleships, the Deutschland class, in the early part of the war, at that point the Royal Navy was not in any real way threatened by them. You had, obviously, Admiral Spey, Admiral Graf von Spey run to the ground by uh, Force H. You had... Okay, fair enough, Admiral Scheer did get out and do some damage to convoys, but it was always under the very, very clear notion that if the Royal Navy caught up with it, uh, then it would be curtains for that particular ship. So, at that point, the Royal Navy looked pretty strong. But by, say, yeah, uh, start of 1942, you've got the Wolf Packs in the Atlantic, demanding vast amounts of Royal Navy time and resources. You've got the Kriegsmarine hold up in Norway... Uh, Wilhelmshaven and Brest demanding even more resources from the Royal Navy to keep an eye on them. You've got a very forgotten but incredibly brutal fight between motor torpedo boats and motor gun boats on the British side and the E-boats or S-boats on the German side in the Channel, and that goes on for quite a few years. Um, you've got convoy escort duty in the arctic you've got this entire separate fight with the italians in the mediterranean you've got general patrol escort and hunter killer duties in the south atlantic and the indian ocean to deal with surface raiders you've got the japanese who are in the process of trying to invade and conquer everything including a number of colonies the british would rather like to keep um so between all of this the Royal Navy has quite badly stretched, and so this is kind of the times when they can look weak, because yes, they are genuinely worried about Tirpitz getting out and slaughtering everything in sight if it gets into an Arctic convoy. Overall, on paper, the Royal Navy shouldn't have to worry, because it's still got over a dozen capital ships, and, well, Tirpitz is just the one ship, but the Royal Navy doesn't have those dozen capital ships in home waters it has a relative few, and it doesn't have that many modern capital ships, which are the ones it would really like to take up against something like Tirpitz, which is an overly large modern capital unit in and of itself. And so this is where the Royal Navy, as they can look somewhat weak. It's not that on the whole the Royal Navy is going to be destroyed by Tirpitz sailing out and challenging a heavy covering force, but that heavy covering force might well have some difficulty dealing with a German capital ship sortie, especially bearing in mind that Turpit still has Scharnhorst and uh, several other me heavy cruisers to call on as an overall formation. And so uh, this, is this I think, is where the, the variation comes. And then you've also got things like, with, say, with Operation Sea Line, obviously the Royal Navy is going to pour pretty much all of its considerable resources into defending its home and it's got to deal with at that point a very badly weakened Kriegsmarine which as we said was already the smallest of the navies that it actually ended up having to fight and they, they'd been badly weakened at that point so yeah on in that scenario with sort of almost backs against the wall against its weakest opponent the Royal Navy looks absolutely massive and overpowered whereas if you look at something like the Indian Ocean raid uh, by Nagumo's Kido Butai, then the Royal Navy looks very weak um, in comparison. So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that makes things slightly clearer, or possibly even more confused, but hey, uh, there's a reason ostriches and books on fire come relatively close to demonstrating the state of the Admiralty at times during the Second World War. Castellane Teva asks, what about Russian and perhaps Japanese shipwrecks from the Battle of Tsushima. Has there been any research to find them? Uh, if not, why not? And uh, would it be interesting to see the exact extent of the damage to the ships? 
I believe the location of many of the wrecks, if not all of them, is actually known. The main problems you've got are that, well, the Tsushima Straits are still very busy shipping lanes. And also, well, the whole area is subject to some very violent weather pretty much every year, which... A, means that the wrecks themselves, as far as anyone can tell, are not in the best condition, um, mostly through just being tossed around all the time by violent waters during typhoons and such, um, but also because of that shipping, it makes it very difficult to have a sort of a position survey ship because you have the very relatively high risk of being run down by a tanker or a cargo ship or something like that. Um, so yeah, it, it would be interesting, I think, if the ships are still in a good enough condition to tell us anything. Um, which, to be perfectly honest, by this point, it's been well over 100 years. In fact, well, 1905, it's been 115 years since the Battle of Tsushima. I'd be very surprised if the wrecks are in a decent enough condition for us to learn much from them. If they are... Um, then I think that probably would make a very nice place for the RV Petrol to stop off uh, next time it's able to set sail, but I'm not necessarily going to be holding my breath on that. Kyla Stern asks, Would Germany in World War I have been better off building a fleet completely comprised of battle cruisers instead of battleships, since their tactics of basically trying to pick off the Royal Navy in small groups would have been far easier, and they could have been disengaged very easily in a Jutland type of engagement. On the surface, it might seem so. However, it does run afoul of a few practical issues given realistic Imperial Germany, one of which is battle cruisers are incredibly expensive. Yes, okay, fair enough, they usually lack one of the main battery turrets compared to their battleship counterparts, and yes, they do have thinner armour than their battleship counterparts, even the German ones, but they're usually much bigger hulls, because they need to be longer for speed, they displace more, and overall cost therefore goes up, and they have an awful lot more machinery, and that's quite expensive. So, an individual battle cruiser will cost, on average, more than your average battleship, which in turn means that a German fleet made up of all battle cruisers in World War One is going to be even smaller than the historic High Seas Fleet and First Scouting Group were. Well, how much more, I hear you ask? Roughly 30 to 40 percent when you're talking about the German ships. Um, so, given that the Germans had uh, 16 battleships, dreadnought battleships, present at the Battle of Jutland, if you take that and you think, okay, well, at 30-40% more expense, how few many ships are we going to lose? That takes you down to about 12. So, yeah, you're basically losing an entire battle squadron. Now, of course, that you can add first scouting groups, so your overall numbers bump up slightly. So you'd have a total of 17 capital ships. Now, the problem with that is that if you're talking about a Jutland era force of 17 capital ships, and bear in mind that going further back um, you would have fewer ships because ships wouldn't have come into service yet, and that's completely ignoring also the fact that because they're bigger and more expensive battle cruisers take longer to build, so there probably would have been even less, so this is kind of a best case scenario. But if you've got a British Admiral commanding a full battle squadron, which would be eight ships, because um, the battle squadrons were generally split into two divisions, each of four. But if you've got a battle squadron of eight battleships, even assuming the British don't respond to this by building their own, um, then if you include the battle cruiser fleet, um, and again, it's, this is, uh, Jutland is a very specific thing, so let's just take the actual battle cruisers that Beatty had, first, second, and third battle cruiser squadrons. That means that you've got. Uh, all the Invincibles, you've got two Indefatigables, Australia's obviously away in dock, and you've got the Lion, Tiger, Queen Mary, and Princess Royal. So you have nine British battle cruisers, and assuming they get a squadron as they want, eight British battleships, that's 17 ships. So a single British, full-strength British battle squadron and the battle cruisers, not counting Australia, 
already match your own forces. And if they have Australia, they've got one more ship. And if they have 5th Battle Squadron tooling around as well, then big problems. So the the main issue is that it would drop German, Germany's overall capital ship numbers down to the point that actually isolating an ba individual battle squadron alongside the battle cruisers is only just about an even fight. And it, it's not the kind of break them off and annihilate them that you would be possible with the high seas fleet um and of course tough as german battle cruisers are they're still less tough than the german battleships were so yeah overall probably wouldn't have been a smart move christopher brandt asks two questions one of which is more suitable for the next uh dry dock live stream but the other one is were there any admirals or naval officers tried at nuremberg or any other Allied war tribunal. So yes, at the Nuremberg trials themselves, Admirals Reda and Dönitz were both on trial. Uh, both of them were found guilty of a number of charges, but also not guilty of others. For example, Dönitz was charged, and actually, well, in that particular case, convicted of unrestricted submarine warfare, which was a crime under the London Naval Treaties, but since the U.S. had engaged in the same thing and he was defended on that count by several U.S. officers, um, he wasn't actually given a sentence for that particular issue. Uh, Reda ended up spending most of the subsequent years of his life in prison and then was released on grounds of ill health before dying at the end of the 1950s. Um, Dönitz, on the other hand, had a relatively short sentence um, and then went back to actually a fairly active life and lasted for quite a while afterwards. Bale Iniora asks, Mahan and Corbett, what are the main differences and who favoured whom? The funny thing is, in a lot of ways, Julian Corbett, Corbett and Alfred Thayer Mahan actually agreed on a lot more than people think they disagreed on. They both fully agreed that control of the sea was one of the key principles to victory. But where their main differences lie, and who favoured whom, is kind of simultaneously self-explanatory, and you'll see what I mean. So Mahan is effectively writing from a position of a navy or a nation which did not have command of the sea. So a lot of his work, uh, as influential as it was, was about pointing out that he who commands the sea often wins the war. In fact, almost always wins the war, unless it's a completely landlocked war for obvious reasons. Um, and therefore, it was vital, if you wanted to win the war, to take command of the sea. And he viewed the best way of doing that as via decisive battle. Then you exercise control and command of the sea, as I've discussed in um, previous videos. Now, that obviously presupposes that you don't have command of the sea to start with. Now, whereas Julian Corbett's writings are a lot more about how you exercise that command of the sea and how you maintain it. And being British, writing at a time when the Royal Navy had command of the sea, it's perhaps not entirely unsurprising that this would be the main focus of how he would look at things. And pretty much that his writings to a very great extent did inform royal navy strategy this is a, i mean it's a bit of a trite statement but you've heard, or, uh, probably heard the statement about admiral jellico he's the only man who can lose a war in the afternoon in an afternoon this is a classic reflection of corbett's thinking actually because whilst yes a mahanian decisive battle might suggest that this is where um, the the war could be won or lost. In actuality, Corbett's point was: you, if you have command of the sea, you don't want to risk it in an all-out decisive battle because then you might lose it. If you've already got it, don't give it up. Exercise it. Hit the enemy where it hurts, using your control and command of the sea. If you have to fight for it, then fine, fight for it. But you are kind of putting a lot more at risk and. Uh, on the table than your opponent might be. So the idea that Jellicoe really doesn't want to be the man who ends up losing the war in the afternoon is actually more a reflection of, of Corbett-type thinking than Mahanian thinking. Um, now, obviously, I mean, ju just discussing Mahan's 
con content and publications would take an entire Wednesday video and trying to put core bits on top of that, there's no way you can answer that in five minutes in extensive detail. Um, that is, his, uh, some principles of naval warfare would need its own uh, video to probably to accompany the one on Mahan's. But effectively summarising that and summarising the whole thing in, in a couple of coherent sentences, Mahan was looking from a position of, we need to take command of the sea, and the best way to do that is to destroy the enemy in a big decisive battle. Corbett was looking at things, admittedly from a position where you might need to take command of the sea, but generally assumed that you probably already did have command of the sea, or at least had the capacity to take it. And so his point of view was more, what you need is the sea control, as Mahan had said, but how he felt it should be best done was whatever means were necessary. If that happened to be a decisive battle, then so be it. But he was equally at home with picking off enemy ships piecemeal, blockading them in port, or just safeguarding your own lines of sea control and communication such that the enemy couldn't really meaningfully peck away at them. And any of these, as far as he was concerned, would give you control of the sea, which you could then... Um, exploit in order to attain victory so it was it was a little bit more subtle a little less in your face uh, than Mahan's thinking but you can see why the Royal Navy would tend to at least internally want a more Corbettian approach to things whereas uh, the German Navy or indeed anyone else or indeed the British public uh, preferred the more grandiose uh, fixed decisive battle of Mahan's theory. Thomas Farley asks, in the latter stages of the Battle of Tsushima, a Japanese torpedo boat dropped a cluster of chain-linked mines in the path of a Russian ship. Ship hits the chain, drawing one or more mines into contact with a hull, and boom. What was this weapon? And since it sounds like it could be ex extremely effective situationally, why was it not in more common use? Well, as the description suggests, it was basically a set of naval mines, usually two, but sometimes more, that were just linked together with a strong section of chain, with the idea of them acting as basically a giant tripwire. Enemy ship hits the chain, um, then obviously the mines get dragged into the ship's uh, sides, and down goes the ship. It did see a fair bit of interest and development in the immediate post-Tsushima world. Um, the reason it wasn't so commonly used is basically because it is a very situational weapon for use in a very close quarters pell-mell battle. Basically because, well, as you might imagine, a chain strong enough to survive being hit by a several thousand ton ship moving at speed is going to be relatively thick, which means it's going to be relatively heavy, and mines only have so much buoyancy, so you can't string the mines along too far, otherwise the chain's just going to drag them down, or else you start getting really complicated of adding multiple mines to the chain, and then it becomes very expensive over what's actually, relatively speaking, a relatively short distance. If you're laying mines in minefields, your spacing is going to be quite considerable, in part because you don't want the shockwave from one mine going off to set off other mines by sympathetic detonation, and in part because, well, you have no idea where the enemy's going to pass through. So they could pass through 20 miles that direction, 20 miles that direction, or right where you are. So you're kind of taking a little bit of a potluck with deploying a regular minefield, and so the distances between the mines are going to be relatively large because, well, just sheer surface area, you can't build enough mines to meaningfully um, m cover the kind of areas you would be for area denial with mine sort of every ship length or so um they're going to have to be more spaced out and as we said you can't do that the, like the sheer weight of the chain and the mat the volume taken up by the chain let alone anything else would end up occupying vast amounts of your deck space so they're not kind of general purpose weapons they are however useful in situations where you can much more narrowly predict the path of an enemy ship like say at the Battle of Tsushima if you can dive in quite close and drop them off then if you're dropping off single mines there's still a chance they might evade or you might be slightly off and they miss but if you've got a few dozen meters of chain you can probably predict 
within a reasonable degree of accuracy and without too much weight penalty where the enemy is going to come and thus the chain kind of rounds off those options for you to the degree it makes it much more likely the enemy is going to get caught by it so that's basically the reason it wasn't in more common use is because it effectively relies on you with your mine deploying ship running a kind of drive by across the front of the enemy vessel which is not the wisest thing to do when you've got a bunch of armed sea mines on deck at close range um it, it worked at tsushima very situationally but yeah outside of that once various ships firepower and speed had gotten better and gun range had gotten longer it was no longer really a practical idea jonathan smith asks in dry dock 109 you talked about the significant trade-offs to build or modify a turret for higher gun elevation and then mentioned the alternative of supercharges what were the downsides to supercharges and why did the royal navy prefer to modify turrets rather than simply supply supercharges to all their older battleships there are a few reasons the Royal Navy preferred to modify their turrets. Now, some of it is relatively simple. If you fire your guns at a higher elevation, obviously the shells will go higher um, in all likely circumstances unless you've elevated them by only a fraction more as compared to supercharges. And gravity is a thing. So if your guns are, say, firing at 20 degrees, the original fixed uh, maximum angle of a 15-inch gun turret, then they can only travel so far before gravity pulls them back down again. Um, that so far being dependent on their speed. Whereas if you fire them at 30 degrees, they go a lot higher up and therefore gravity has a lot further to bring them down which in turn means that assuming that they have a decent speed they can travel faster no, further i should say now that fair enough is a fairly simplistic explanation that relies largely on the muzzle velocity not being too different between a supercharged shell launched at a 20 degree angle as opposed to a normal shell launched at a 30 degree angle but th there are some more details to it Another point is that if you fire a supercharge, or indeed use a high velocity gun, the shell's angle of descent is going to be shallower as opposed to firing a gun with a normal charge at a higher elevation. And at the kind of elevations that you're actually reaching out to um, with either supercharges or extra elevation on your gun turrets, i.e. 23, 24,000 yards plus, Unless you're using something like the Italian hyper warp cannons um, of the of their World War Two 15 inch guns, um, your penetration of armor out at those kind of ranges is probably going to start looking a little bit lacking in a lot of cases against the armor belts of your average battleship. Whereas if you're firing them at a 30 degree angle so they're coming down a lot steeper you're more likely to hit the deck and because of the steeper angle the deck penetration is much more likely as opposed to uh, a supercharged uh, shell coming in at a shallower angle if it hits a deck it's much more likely to bounce off so there is that um, as you probably know i have my own personal issues with the actual viability of long-range deck penetrating shooting in World War II based on historical evidence and results, but that's neither here nor there um, from a conceptual perspective in the late 1930s. However, there is one other major downside to the supercharges, and that is that they are pretty much at the limits of what the gun barrel can take safely over a kind of extended period of time. However, just because it can take it safely over an extended period of time doesn't mean there isn't degradation. They're going to be firing with a lot more energy and that means there's going to be more barrel wear, there's more pressure, more heat, etc. So your guns are going to wear out sooner 
Um, if there's any minor flaws in the guns, then firing them with more shock from a bigger explosive charge is more likely to reveal them and expand them. So a gun that may not have failed or would suffer maybe a low order failure being fired under regular charges might fail catastrophically when firing using supercharges. You've also got the fact that, well, recoil has to go somewhere and the recoil mechanisms on the guns, well, whilst they had a degree of safety factor built in, were designed with normal charges in mind. So that shock's going to be transmitted to equipment within the turret and the turret itself. So um, your loading mechanisms, the recoil mechanism itself, the barbette, the ship, etc., etc. All of these are going to have significantly greater shocks for every shot fired, which cumulatively over time will result in a bigger maintenance bill and again possibly failures you've also got the matter of you're gonna have to be stocking more explosive on the ship or reduce your overall shell count um, neither of which is a particularly pleasant prospect to be thinking about um, also because the charges are going to weigh slightly more it's probably going to take slightly longer to load them so your overall rate of fire is probably going to go down slightly and ultimately as was proved by the use of supercharges at 20 degrees as opposed to normal charges at 30 supercharges can't match the range extension they can go some way towards mitigating it but they don't mitigate it entirely so supercharges do have that that issue that just elevating the guns means you just can shoot further now obviously you can try and combine the two but as recoil becomes more and more of a problem the higher and higher the guns go it's not really advisable unless you've designed for it and the only ship that really combined the ability to fire at 30 degrees maximum elevation with the ability to fire supercharges would be hms vanguard but even she was fitted for but not with supercharges um, in her regular existence. She was designed to be able to use them all the way up to the 30 degree elevation as far as I can tell um, from sources like DK Brown who having been part of the Royal Navy's um, ship design bureau if you like the naval construction section um, at the time when Vanguard was still in service I think he'd know. Um, but because of these various negative effects that the superchargers would have, she didn't fire her guns with them in peacetime. But if it, ha if it had come to war, they would have stocked superchargers on the ship and used them to extend both the range and the hitting power of the shells. Um, and just accept the trade-off of the fact the guns aren't going to last as long. Because at the end of the day, it's best to hit the enemy as hard as you possibly can, um, if you can. And this was the thing, the 30 degree elevation uh, turrets that were modified for things like Warspite, Queen Elizabeth, Renown and Valiant weren't designed to take that at the 30 degrees. Vanguard's turrets had to be fairly extensively modified, so they weren't able to combine the two together. And that's all for this week, everyone, with just one small piece of channel admin. I have started a website eventually. Uh, it's drakinfl.co.uk. And if you need to know how to spell that, just look at the channel name. Um, and it's uh, fair enough. It's a basic website at the minute. It is kind of put together by me. I am not the world's greatest web designer. Nevertheless, have a look, check it out, give some feedback. The main purpose of the website is to host the various images that I've scanned and um, hosting for public domain use um, so there's a there's a few of the um, sections up at the moment partly populated it's nowhere near the amount I've actually scanned but it turns out up formatting a page uploading all the pictures linking them all to the high-res versions of hosted on archive.org etc does take quite a while so each week I aim to try and add maybe several dozen more and that'll just keep going for quite a while, I suspect. So yeah, just have a look and um, have fun browsing.